Hello and welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. Welcome to one of the internet's best podcasts, where we dive deep into the lives of the extraordinary and fascinating people who leave an indelible mark on our world. Join us as we explore their captivating stories, remarkable achievements, and unique perspectives that shape history and inspire generations. Get ready to embark on a journey through the lives of inspiring people unlike any other. Hello, folks, and welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. My name is indeed Avram Rosenzweig, and I'm really, really happy to be here with you. Thank you so much for tuning in. You know, throughout life, we are uh, really seldomly called upon to be courageous and brave in a very deep way. Um, but when we are, it's always a question in our, mind, uh, in our minds as to how we're going to respond to that. Will we respond in a way that we always hope that we would? Um, or otherwise, you know, uh, so many Jews have asked uh, ourselves a question as to whether we would be righteous, as in righteous Gentiles, in our lives in, in a terrible time in history. Would we have gone out of our way to save somebody else as righteous Gentiles have ha, did, uh, saving Jews during the Holocaust? And that was at the peril of their own lives, and that was at the peril of the lives of their children. And I know that I've asked myself that that question. Now, when it comes to myself, my answer is slowly, uh, yeah, I would risk my own life for somebody else. But then the question comes up is, God forbid, what about the life of my child? And then things get really murky. We are very, very honored uh, to have with us today an individual, Itai Sagi who has shown courage and bravery at the young age of 25, fighting in uh, the Israel Defense Force. He's a veteran, and he is uh, here in Toronto, my hometown, this week and uh, for a bit longer, actually, to discuss what he went through after October 7th. So, Itai, welcome to the show. I am really, it's a kavod. It's an honor for me to have you here today. Thank you very much. I heard so much about you, and I'm... Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I, I also want to say that this show is uh, uh, sponsored by Beit HaLochem. If you have not heard of Beit HaLochem, then you got to do your research on it because it is a magnificent nonprofit organization uh, based around the world, but their work is done in Israel to help veterans uh, of the war, of not only this war, but other wars as well. And they help well over 50,000 uh, over veterans. 60, over 61,000. Okay, so the numbers and are rising. We're growing by the day. Um, yeah, you know, right. Those amazing people that almost gave the ultimate sacrifice uh, need to get rehab and need to get as much help as they need. And that's why I'm here. So, Itai, let, let me ask you first off. You, you uh, fought on October the 11th. Um, in response to the terrorist attack of October 7th. Just in generally, how are you doing? How, how are you feeling? So prior to that, I was um, a student for, I, I was studying coding and computer science. Well, after I got injured, I couldn't touch the computer anymore. I can't write any more code. It's not real enough for me. And my role in life changed. And what I'm focusing on right now is getting better, getting well, treat myself and the people that surround me and do things that make me and my, my people more whole. Like I can't do any more coding. I just need to be with people. I, I'm speaking about my story. I'm, I'm honoring my teammates every day about speaking about them. And I do advocacy for Israel. And here, advocacy in the name of all the 60,000 Beit uh, uh, injured veterans. Don't you find it interesting how your life can change in a moment? I understood that life, each and every one of us life, is the most fascinating movie that we'll ever watch. Yeah. And we should see it like that. And it really helps to, to go through the hardest thing in life. Uh, that I experienced as well. Like my so, injury. Let, let, 
let, let's tell your story. Let's let's tell our listeners and our viewers what happened. I'll tell the first few uh, sentences and you can pick up on it. At 25 year old, as a reservist in the Maglan Special Forces Unit, in, uh, the, his team embarked upon a mission to battle Hamas. En route, their truck broke down near Kibbutz Zikim, a site impacted by the terrorist attacks. As one group stayed to fix the vehicle, another group uh, went to fight and they ended up at a bomb. When they got to the shelter, they were ambushed. What? Pick up on the narrative. Okay, so yeah, we when we passed Kibbutz Zikim, we had a, a mission. After four days of fighting, we saw all the terrible things that happened. And we felt privileged and honored to actually be there and protect the Jewish people and Israelis. And it gives you so much strength. And finally, after four days on the October 11th, we had a special mission. We were supposed to be deployed on the border with Gaza, wait for the night, and during that night to um, secure convoys that will supposed to go in very sneakily, very quiet, and get back some of the hostages back to Israel. That I only learned recently. It was secret. We didn't know why we were going there. All we knew that it was about saving life. So on the way there, we started to get a motor shelled. We started to drive as fast as we can, do whatever we can to keep us safe. And of course, in that moment that you knew that everything will work like a clock, Murphy's Law, one of the cars malfunctioned. We're a team of 24, and we split inside of Israel. Again, there aren't supposed to be any more terrorists inside of Israel. And me and half of the force of 12 continued to your next by bomb shelter, which was around one and a half kilometers. The other half of the force stayed there on the road, and uh, was prepping to tow the car away to safety towards us. And we just took caution. We said, we don't need all of us to be in danger. And that's what happened. So we got to the bomb shelter with a huge bushes just surrounding it. It's all scattered around. Again, they're shelling us like crazy with the rockets. And the most curious thing, you just see rockets falling to your left and to your right, uh, 20 meters away, 50 meters away. And you know you're in big danger. But we decided that we'll keep six guys outside of the bomb shelter to keep us safe, to be in danger, but to keep us safe, the one inside. And like that, I went inside with another guys. They stayed outside. And I have to tell you something about that. I served in a special unit. It was really hard to get there. And I learned how to shoot very accurately. I learned how to react very fast. And the people that stay in this unit, do the same. But the guys, the teammates that stayed and finished out of hundreds of people, and we finished 24 guys, the one that stayed are not the best shooters, are not the best fighters. No. They are the people that put you in front of them and before them every single time, every single day, and will take care of you before they'll take care of them. They'll give their life for you, and only then they'll care about themselves. And those are the guys you can fight with every single day because you know that you'll do for them the same they'll do for you. So they stayed outside. I went inside. One minute passed by, heavy rocket fire on us still. Two minutes passed by, it's really quiet for some reason. So I go and look at them outside. I see them all ready, eager, whatever it takes. And less than 20 seconds later, all hell broke loose. Eight Nukhba terrorists opened fire at us from all those bushes, from all directions. I see all of my teammates, my best friends, just falling at the same time to the ground, some responding, some not, but I know that all of them got shot and I feel the bullets flying next to me as well. I see the bullet ricochets and I know that all of my life took me here to this moment to fight the best I can to be the sharpest I can, but more importantly, to be the best friend I can and to buy time 
and to do whatever it takes to save my people, to save my friends. I hold my rifle. I'm very calm, like they trained me to do. I don't have any feelings in that moment. All I need to do is I need to act. Take a deep breath. One of my friends crawling next to me is shouting, they're shooting me, they're shooting me. He got three bullets in his leg. I see a terrorist just emerging outside of a bush, looking at me, start to shoot at me with his automatic rifle. I take a breath. I point my gun at him. I release one bullet into his head and take him out. And all I know that I need to do is buy time. The other half of the team is on the way here. We're going to get through it. And I'm really positive. I'm even smiling because when in this situation, there is no hope. But especially there, you need to have the biggest hope that you have. You need to believe that everything will be fine. Even that half of the team is already out. And that's another terrorist. He shoot at me. I shoot at him. I change position. I want to take him out. And I just sprint at him. I surprise him. I didn't expect that. And I see his big dead eyes. Eyes full of hate, full of, I don't know how to explain it, just hate and fire. They didn't want to do anything just to kill us. I pushed my rifle into him from point blank, released six bullets. He died, and then I looked behind me and I saw two dead terrorists, and I knew we were going to get out of here alive. I knew that. I believed. And I knew we all cornered, we're only the same small position, more than half of the team is injured, but we are going to survive because we fight for life, we fight for love, we fight for the Jewish people, and all of the Western people around the world. Because what we saw there in the days earlier was animals and terrorists that should be put down. I'm searching for more terrorists. I don't find any, I just hear a lot of shooting towards my position and then i see two grenades being thrown at me i jump to the other way i hear two big explosions and then only ting i just hear ting. like like my hearing was really hurt from that and that's the only thing i hear but i look at myself i'm perfectly fine i go back to my position i'm searching for terrorists i want to fight i want to protect my teammates and then another grenade being thrown at my position, but I don't hear it and I don't see it. It explodes. And from being 120%, being in the moment, being ready for everything, I just collapse. Now, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just feel shock. I feel my body numb. I feel like you detach a wire and there's no connection between the head and the body. And I tell myself, I feel the bullets flying over my head. And I tell myself, okay, this is compromised. I need to change position. And I can't. And like the bullets are just on me. And like, but I can't move. My body is not responding. So that I, I tell myself, Itai, be chill. Your teammates got this. Take a deep breath. And then go back to fight. Probably something happened to you, but you're fine. You don't feel any pain. So I try to breathe but nothing goes through my airways, nothing, just <clears throat> more and more, and I just choke more, and I just tell myself, if I be chill, be positive, no way it's the end, no way that's how you go. Mm-hmm. And I try again and more and more, nothing's worked, and just everything shuts down, my body shuts down, everything turns darker and darker, and I just understand it's the end, but I don't want it to be. And I fight it, but just all turns black. Mm-hmm. And I find myself hovering and floating around the situation. I see the battlefield from above. I see my teammates fighting ferociously. But I don't care. Nothing moved inside of me. Even though that a minute before that, that was all of my life. I cared only about them. Now I don't care. All I want to do is continue with this amazing feeling that surrounding me. I feel loved. I feel protected. I feel hugged. I feel like this most amazing feeling that I ever felt in my life. And I want to continue with this. I just want to go through the big gate over there, continue on with my life, 
and be done with this. This is not interesting anymore. It's nothing. And with this feeling, I see a dead body. For some reason, I don't recognize. And I look at it, and for some reason, that's interesting for me. That was the only interesting thing for me in this, in this moment. And I look harder, and I get closer, and I don't recognize, I don't know who it is, so I get closer and closer, until I'm right on it, and I see the reflection of my own face from that body. Mm. And in this moment, I have flashes of all of the important things in life for me. I don't see the past. I see the future. I see the future of my life. I see how amazing it's going to be. I see pictures of my family, of my teammates, of the house that I will build in my kibbutz. And I see how much love and great things and great opportunities are going to be in my life. And I don't want to get go to waste. All these amazing feelings that were surrounding me, I'm going to have them in my own life. But when I want to look aside and see my teammates fighting again, see how it's going, I just saw the other side of the quarter. I saw a picture of a funeral. In this funeral, there were two parents, my parents, crying over a grave, and I knew exactly who was in there. And I just shook out of this and said, no way this is happening. I'm fighting back. I choose life. I want to go back and fight. I need to be there with my teammates. I need to live. And I look at myself and I just scream at myself, it I start breathing. It's not working, but I don't care. That's the only option that's going to happen. That's the only thing on the table for me. And I scream at myself again and again, four times, until finally I take a deep breath, I open my eyes, I'm in the same shitty situation, they're shooting me from all directions, but I don't care, I feel protected, and I see one of my teammates standing on top of me, protecting me with his own life, with his own body, doing whatever he can, to keep me safe, like I did a minute before on him. And I know this guy is going to take me home, and I know this guy is going to do whatever it takes, he's going to give his own life for me, and doesn't care. He will do everything for me. But I want to go back, I want to fight. I don't know what's wrong with me. All I know is that my body is all sleazy and, and wet, and I don't know why. So I just push myself back into sitting position. I went into the scope. One of my teammates saw that I'm alive. He ran to me. He shouted to me, hey, Ty, you're bleeding heavily. You have a fountain from your neck. You can see maybe here. All of this was open. It was much bigger. It was like this. All of this area was a big hollow space and just blood pumping out of it. And then I feel the biggest pain in my life. He just shoved his hand into my neck. And like that, we fight for another 35 minutes. We kill the rest of the terrorists, the other half of the team arrives. And I was taken away in critical shape by a helicopter. Again, I'm the happiest guy in the world. The happiest guy in the world. Because I appreciate every second that I'm alive. That I have the chance to be alive. I get to the hospital. I see I'm still on the stretcher. I see like 20 doctors on top of me and they start to unravel the bandage from my neck and they're all shocked. They don't know what to do and they start to, I heard, I saw the optimism in the room just go down and down and down and they don't know what to do with me. And they're like uh, confused and don't and say toward each other that we can't do this, we can't do this. And like they disagree with each other until one doctor just said, shut up. This guy is going to be totally fine. We're going to close his vessels. We're going to redirect some of them. We're going to clean his wound. We're going to take some flesh from his leg, stick it up there. It's going to be perfectly fine. And he's going to survive. And he was the only guy that had hope in me. And I used that hope. And I said, immediately after I heard him, I want to talk to my mom, like a good Jewish boy. And I'm like, can barely breathe. I'm in big agony. Like I feel all of the pain. Just I feel like you have a Brenner on here and on my arm. I have a lot of fragments here as well. 
this amazing girl that don't care about happening here. She care, care about me. She looks at me and she hear what I'm saying. She called my mom. She stopped them from putting me on anesthesia. She telling my mom, hey, uh, it's Itai's mother. Uh, it's, uh, it's a social worker. Uh, I'm having Itai's mother on the phone. I want you, my, your son wants to talk with you. He's in the hospital. And in this state, I get my mom. And she's like, Itai, what's wrong? What is happening? Why are you in the hospital? Please tell me. And I was, hey, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. I have fragments in my arm. They're going to take it out now in the surgery. I just want to let you know before. Now, it's true, but it was a big lie as well because I was in a life-threatening situation. And I just want to hear her voice and tell her that everything is fine. And she said, oh, okay, thank you. I love you very much. Keep care, t take it care and call me when you wake up. I said, okay, mom, love you very much. Mm -hmm. And she hanged up. I think I just needed, I didn't know if I'm gonna wake up from that. I just need to hear her voice one more time uh, to feel love. I don't know, I just, I felt like I lost so much during the battle, I remembered everything that happened and I saw too much injured people. And when I woke up, the only thing that I asked again and again, and no one was telling me anything, was who died. Because I remember my best friends, my teammates fighting, and I remember them getting shot. And I remember too much of them not talking to me. I remember too much of them sleep and I was already griefing and I knew exactly what happened but I couldn't believe it till only after four hours and the only question that I ask is what happened with my teammates finally they came to my room with an army officer a social worker and told me This three of my, of my best friends died and gave their life. The name is Idoka Slasi, Itai Moreno, and Daniel Castiel. The best people I know. And since then, I promised myself that I'm going to be a better version of myself. Even though my injury even though I can't feel half of my face, even though I have like problems with my neck and with my arm, I don't care. Everything I'm doing is in the name of them and I'm gonna get better. And every day I'm gonna grow a little bit more and I'm gonna walk and then I'm going to the bathroom and then I'm going to get mental treatment. But I owe it to them and I owe it to the other half of my team that continued fighting later in Gaza, which I'm so proud of them. And they gave me so much purpose in life to know that we lost so much. We lost so much. The Jewish people, Israel. But every day we keep on fighting because we have so much more to fight for and to live for and to be thankful. And I almost lost my life but I got it back and I'm so thankful for what I do have. And for this, there is an amazing organization called Betel Chem. This is why I'm here. I'm here on behalf of more than 60,000 injured veterans that every day need to get better. And this organization come and take them and treat them well and help them go back on their feet or on their prosthetics or with their PTSD, whatever it is, and telling them, we're going to give you a life back and you're going to have a better life. We'll do whatever it takes. And I am here in the honor of them, in the honor of my fallen friends and thousand more that gave their life and got injured just for us to be able to sit here talking in this nice podcast and be thankful and gratitude for what we have. And that's what it's all about for me. You have a magnificent spirit, Itai.
Tell us a little bit about those three friends of yours. What were they like? So Ido was a funny guy. He was like uh, easy going, but he knew that if he wants, he can move mountains and everything will order up and do exactly like he said. Yeah. Castile was the joker. <laughs> Everything that he said was hilarious. He was funny, he was kind. The most important thing to him was a team and that will always be united and together and he couldn't tolerate any fight, anything, just he always looked at what's important. He said, guys, look at us, we're together, we're important, we can't fight, never. And it was really funny. It was an arts, you know. Moreno was the most deepest guy that I knew. He just can look at you and know exactly what's wrong and know exactly what's good. And he looks into your soul every time you talk to him and he says everything you need to hear. And he was my uh, Northern star. He was my guide, my mental guide for years about everything and all of them were my best friends and I cherish and I know that right now they're looking at me and they're looking at all of us from above and they don't want us to be in grief they're in a better place what they do want us from is to have the best life that we can and be the best version of ourselves and just enjoy it and appreciate what we do have because they left us a legacy and from that legacy, we should make something better and bigger than before. That's all. What, what was it like for you to uh, kill two terrorists? I didn't care. I was mostly fascinated by the hate. It, it, it shaken something inside me because I never felt any hate in my life especially not towards head terrorists, which they're only fighting out of hate. We never fought out of hate. We fight out of love toward each other, out of the, the uh, we want to protect the people that we live. And you know, in the end, I was a veteran. Like I had my own life. I did my own things. I don't want to go and fight. I never wanted to kill people. I will do it again and again to save my people every single day to save my own people, my own family, and I don't feel any regrets. And my nightmares are not from the terrorists, they're from my teammates, that I care about them, that they left me and left us. Uh, that's, that's my nightmares. The terrorists, they're just sad people that I feel sorry for them mostly. Do you think you were brave? What? Do you think you were courageous? Yes. I think that each and every one of my teammates in my own place during the time will do the exact same thing and will act the same or even better. I believe in that because I know that. Because I know that the minute that I went out, they took my spot. And they did whatever it takes to keep me safe. Because that's what you do in Maglan, that's what you do in the IDF. You take care of your own people. And that's the only thing that's important, more than you. And yes, did I was you... brave. But more than I was brave, I was really, sorry, I was really scared for my life. Of course, I don't want to die. But more than that, I care about my teammates. So that's, what you, that's why you fight. Explain that to me that your fear for yourself was less than your fear or your concern for your teammates. How, how does that work? Like I told you, the one that stays in the unit are the one that's able to put your, their teammates in front of them and before them again and again and again. And it needs to be automatic. And after a year and a half, 
of eating shit every day, of not going home, of not sleeping, of having no clothes and in this in the winter in the night and the only way you can keep off from just being together uh-huh. of not knowing what will happen the next day or the next hour you see who is your best friends you see who will take care of you and you have this special bond after you fight together after you get wounded together after you save life and after you kill bad guys together So yeah, they're my blood and my family. Like you will do it to your own family, like you'll save your family and you will give your life for them. That's the connection between an uh, organic team in Maglan. Who was the fellow who put his hand into your open neck? He remembered, like I asked him, he saved my life. We're really good. He's one of my best friends, of course. We're teammates. He's a combat medic. Before he did that, he was teaching one of my other friends and he saw that my state is more severe and he can just push and stop the bleeding from the leg. So he just looked at me. He ran to me. He was very calm, very chill. When I screamed, he said, if I shut up, keep on guarding. Yeah. And he did what it needs to be do. He saved my life. He, he literally put his hand in your neck inside of it right so you see the hole right yeah yeah I see it make it almost three times bigger yeah I'm after two plastic surgeries and it's not like you cut it and it's opened like you don't have anything it was rough flesh it was I didn't have any skin I didn't have any I don't have my juggler anymore they extracted it was gone it's a miracle that I'm alive. How do you feel about your neck being open like that? What, what, what do you think like existentially? How does that affect you? Um, at first, I wanted to go away. I didn't want to do anything about it. And the doctor told me they can do another skin graft and they can make it smaller and smaller with more uh, plastic surgeries. But then I just started to look at it and I said, and I grew a beard. Mm-hmm. because I felt like he's a single uh, a, a sign of, of failure but after you understand that everything that comes from above you should look at it like a blessing even though sometimes it's wrapped with a, something that may look like a course I got grateful for what I have here mm-hmm. and every time I look at it, I look at what I endured and where I was and where I am now. And every day it's a reminder. Right now I'm looking at it. And it's a reminder for me from where I was that I need to learn again how to use my right arm, that I need to do this and this, which was so painful, and now I can do this and this. Mm. And everything in life is vi- vo- valuable. The small things is much important. And now it's small. But it meant so much and it still is and if it will go away why like uh, I look at it and I'm so proud of myself from what I achieved hmm. even though sometimes it looks ugly and I, I can't feel all this time I, I don't feel all of this there's no there's no nerves and these two uh, these two fingers I don't feel as well that's who I am and I'm proud of myself. Show me a full smile. Yeah, there you go. So you have a full smile. Yeah. My jaw doesn't – it opens that way. Okay. Okay. You know, one day your little children, God willing, when you get married and have children, they're going to ask you, Daddy, what's that? And I'll be really proud to tell them. Good for you. Good for you. Your father is a farmer. Uh, he raises chickens, and his name is Shimon. Your mother is Yafid, and she's a tour guide. And here's what she said when asked how she felt about your situation. It's very hard for a mother to part with her children and send them in battle, even when she knows it's for the greater good of our nation. When they find out that their child was wounded during combat, it's even harder. How was your mom and dad after your situation? 
when they really found out? So while I was in anesthesia, while I was under surgery, one of the doctors called them and just told them the whole truth and told them that they don't know if I'll survive. Probably my right side of the face, if I will survive, will be like this. And my right arm will never work. My dad was freaking out. My mom was calm. She was scared, but she was calm. They didn't believe her that she talked with me, my family, all my family, all my siblings. They said, you didn't talk with it. I, we just heard the situation. No way he was able to talk. He can barely, he can't breathe. And then she said again and again, no, he talked with me. He's fine. He's going to be fine. And my mom was the only calm and, and positive during that night. My other family just freaked out. So I'm really, I'm really happy I talked with my mom. It's still hard for them. Still, I cry a lot. They cry a lot about what could have happened. But that's why I should get better and show them that I'm a better me. With my loss, with the thing, I'm a better version. And I every day treat that with my mental state and with my physical state. You like yourself now? You liked yourself before? Or is it different? I like both. You like both? Every day I like more. And every day I learn something new. So, yeah. Let me ask you something. Your mother's Brazilian, right? Yes. What is it about her strength? Where does she come up with that? What do you mean? It, it, I, I know as a father, I have an 18-year-old son. I'm a pachtan. I'm a nervous wreck. God forbid something should go wrong. He calls me, Daddy, I'm not feeling well. I go, oh, my God. But your mother, seeing the worst, she acquiesced. She was there. She was strong. Yeah. She had her own role. Each and every one of us has a role. And when people break next to you, someone needs to be strong. And she's when always get injured, someone needs to fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the same. And she actually heard me. And she said, it's going to be fine. And she believed in me. And your father is a chicken farmer. What is his life like? What is Ofi, his character, like? He's the smartest guy I know. Yeah. Uh, he has the biggest heart that I'll ever saw in my life. But don't mess with him. <laughs> He's yeah. one of those. You can't, you can't mess with him. Or you're going to get treated like a prince. Or you need to get all of the dead chickens out of the farm as a punishment. <laughs> and as, as a farmer, uh, I'm assuming... You need a particular type of character. Now, as a child, you were helping out on the farm? Yeah, of course. What, what, what did that give you in terms of your own character? You have perspective. You know that you live an amazing life, but it happened because your dad is messing up with chicken shit. And you know where everything has come from, and you know that the food on your plate is there for a reason and you know exactly where it comes from. It doesn't come in a nice bag. It come because there's people that wake up at 2 a.m. and take care of chickens and clean them up. And then you get this really nice bags. So everything is in perspective. Did you do that as a kid? I, I helped my dad. We, never, we don't uh, clean the chicken. We, we just raise them. But yeah, I know exactly how everything works there. Now, you are one of four siblings, plus your family has taken in a foster child. Um, tell us a little bit about your foster brother. So my family, is, uh, like I said, the most warming family, the most lovable, really, like, so much love. And when I got 16, they wanted more. Mm -hmm. But they're already old folks. Uh, so we were able to help the world by having an amazing six-year-old uh, child. Uh, you know, it's, like I said, we have so much. It's all perspective. We have so much love to give. 
and my parents decided to keep on giving. And now, right now, he's a 16 year old. Year old. Sometimes he's a pain in the ass. Yeah. But he's a good little fella. Are you a good bro big brother? I was before better, before the 7th of October. Yeah. Now I think I'm okay, but I, I, I don't have enough time to be home. I, I like study, I changed fields. I studied law and business, and now I'm in my second year. And in the same time, I'm doing all of these shenanigans around the world, uh, doing advocacy and speaking on behalf of amazing organization like Bet Olchem, or on behalf of the state of Israel, explaining the war in the eyes of a soldier, of a veteran. What was it like for you to do your advocacy when you stepped out of Israel, you got on the plane, you landed in a particular place, you stood in front of a group of people and started telling your story like you did now? What was that like in the beginning? I felt like I'm giving people a lot of purpose that people don't know. People care so much about Israel and they don't know how to help. And for me, the best way to help the Jewish people, Israel, is just being united and knowing what it's all about. And if I'm able to be out here and show them that we're all together, we're all united and in Israel, we fight all of our wars. That means a lot. And I'm giving perspective to different crowds, mostly youth, it's really important for me, just to do whatever I can to get as much young Jewish people and, and show them that we're all in the same boat. What is that boat? So, so I feel privileged and I felt like this is my, my battle now. My teammates right now are fighting in Lebanon. I can't fight with them, I'm not able. But how I can help is in advocacy and, and yeah. Like, how, does, yeah. how does it feel not to be able to return to the army? Like I said, everything in life is a blessing. Sometimes it looks like a course. But if you unwrap that course and you see that you have a new role, a new meaning, and you help other people to get well, to get meaning, to be in a different perspective in life, that's fine by me. And how have you been accepted here in the diaspora by people who have listened to you? Amazing. Yeah? Amazing. I, I was overwhelmed by the amount of love that the diaspora Jews has towards Israel. And I was really uh, shocked by the amount of scare that they have. And the reason for that that I found is that in Israel, the Jews take care of their own. We are the master of our own safety. It's hard, but we are. Here, you're not. No one take care of you here. You only have Israel that will take care of you if something really ha bad will happen, which we should always know. Like, that's why I'm here. But you have a really nice policeman, a really nice officer outside of your school, and you count on him. But he's not one of our own. Only, only Israelis get that. You know what I mean? Like, I never felt scared in my life. Never. I don't feel scared here as well because I know I will protect myself. Mm -hmm. But here, Jewish communities need someone else to protect them. And this someone sometimes, in the, when you really need it, he will not probably do it. I hope he will. But that's why we need a strong Israel. Now, Itai, you, you talked about Beit HaLochem. It's, uh, it's a magnificent organization. I was thinking this morning that it's a type of organization that I would love my son to be involved with. Um, you know, it sort of qualifies itself as a second home for wounded warriors. It can be found in Jerusalem, Ashtod, Haifa, Beersheba, and Tel Aviv, and a number of different places in Israel. Tell us what Beit HaLachom's mission statement is. To take broken people rather if it's PTSD or physical state, like me, like other, and get them back on track. 
makes them see that there is a future, that there is something better for them. There is a huge community of people just like them that having the best life that they can have. And as a young, injured veteran, that all of your life falls apart because you lost your eyesight, because you lost your legs, because you lost everything. You see there is a bright future to you. And that's what it's all about. And giving their life back in each and every one which is own different way. And there, is, sorry, and there is amazing facilities for that. Each and every one of those facilities is huge with hundreds of therapists and, th and amazing pools and like gyms and everything is like for cripple and for people that don't have legs and people that don't have arms and people like me that have both arms. Did they ever feel sorry for you? Who? The people at Beit HaLochem. No, we were all together the same. I don't like feeling sorry. It's I a bad that. way to it's a bad way to release energy. The reason I asked that question is because when I was reading up on you, <clears throat> it was a specific thing that you said that I'm sure that there are people who feel awful for you. They have pity for you. But you said a Beit HaLochem, there was none of that. Right. We're all the same. We all had our own baggages. And that's fine. We know that. Some people are more open, some people are not, but as an injured veteran to an injured veteran, you don't need to explain anything. Yeah, I'm assuming that you've already had you've you've probably had so many late nights where you'll sit with an injured veteran and it'll say, Habibi, come, we'll have some hummus and pita. And you'll go barbecue. through your for me it's mostly barbecues. <laughs> there you go, barbecue. And you'll go through your story with them and you'll commiserate, you'll understand some. Like, I can understand you to a certain extent. The Jews here in the Tfutsa can understand you to a certain extent. But veterans, people have gone through what you've gone through. There's a camaraderie. There's a sense of, yeah, I know who you are. Would that be accurate? Yeah. I mean, it's very individual for each and every one. Just a few general questions for you. Um, what would you say is the greatest love in your life? What do you love the most in life? My family, my brothers, my siblings, my kibbutz, my teammates, the things that I saw while I was up there, all those pictures, I love them. And it's not in the big things, it's in the small things. I, I, I just enjoy every single moment and that's how I make my teammates that died for me to be proud of us. They want us to enjoy the way. They want to enjoy each and every moment. Of course, it's hard. Of course, it's grieving. Of course, I cry and have like all of the crazy things that everyone else has. But when I really look inside, I'm grateful. And that's what it's all about. What makes you the most, the happiest in life nowadays? I lost everything. I really did. I I lost so much, but then I got it back. And I lost three teammates. But then one of my other teammates said, Itai, we lost so much, but you saved nine other guys. That means something. That means a lot. And that's, that's the kind of thing that puts me in perspective. That. Every time I take a breath, it wasn't something that is, was regular for me for the start. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. So the happiest things are not come from the having an amazing job, from having a, a lot of money. No, it comes from taking a breath. It's come from appreciate that now I'm healthy. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for that that I'm loved, that I have family, that I have teammates that are alive. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? I can't. 
You can't. I can. I, I change all the time. I don't know where, I don't know how, in what direction. But in the past year, I had the biggest change of my life. And I never thought for a second that this is what will life were uh, putting me up to. But the thing that I love about life is that we can't control anything. We can't. Like, I couldn't control to get into an ambush. I couldn't control to get injured. But the only thing I control and I have full control of is how I react towards what is happening. And this means everything. And I react with positivity and with a smile, even in the darkest time. And when I see all of my friends getting shot in the same time, you need to smile and you need to think about good things. And then hopefully it will happen. What would you say is your greatest achievement to date? And my greatest achievement? Yeah. I'm thinking putting my life back on track. I think that, that, that I was able to start studying again. And I was like, I'm here. I have my own baggages, of course. And for months I was so griefing and I'm still, I'm much more sadder than I was. But at the same time, I'm much more grateful and happy that counters that. And I think that's it. What, what your question was again? What's your greatest achievement in life? So my, great, so my greatest achievement is that I'm able to live a good life with all of the things that right now is going through my head, through my body, that I need to, uh, that I need to handle with. Hmm. You, do you believe in God? Yeah, of course. You have a relationship with God? Yeah. How does that work? When you smile to him, he smiles to your back. No, that's nice. That's nice. Listen, I've been playing around with AI a little bit, artificial intelligence. And I've been asking AI to print up for me with uh, many of my guests uh, a poem about them. So I have a poem here from AI, AI called Itai's Song. You want to hear it? Yeah. It's about you, my friend. And it goes like this. You have a lovely smile, by the way. Ta-da. In the quiet after the storm where silence swells like broken dawn, Itai lies beneath a sky too wide, a soldier's heart, a nation's pride. The earth still whispers of that day, October's rage that swept away. The world he knew, the world he'd fight, now scared in shadow, stolen light. With blood and bone, he stood his ground, the cries of war, a deafening sound. His comrades fall, but not in vain. For every loss, they carve a name. Now wounds define his body's frame, but strength is more than flesh or flame. The battle's fury might have torn his limbs apart, his spirits worn. Yet in his eyes, the fire stays, a soldier's soul that will not stray. For even as the pain holds tight, his will to heal, to rise, to fight. is written deep, not in the skin, but in the heart where wars begin. And though his body bears the scar, his spirit soar, it flies, it's far. The hills of Israel call him home, where fields of peace and memories roam. Etai, who fought with all his might, now rests beneath the endless night. But though the battle's far away, his sacrifice will never fade. A hero's name in whispered breath, beyond the blood, beyond the death. And when the skies once more turn blue, Etai rises, and so will you. I want that one. No? Very nice. I will send it to you, my friend. Yeah, thank you. Etai, how is your English so good? So as a teenager, I was in an exchange student program in San Francisco, and I was supposed to come to Canada, but I didn't have the money, so I didn't. But I hosted Canadians from Vancouver. Yeah. And for years, I wanted to be a pilot, like a commercial pilot. And I knew that the best place for me to do that was Houston, Texas. And for that, I need good English. So I was nagging my American friends for years 
doing video chats, uh, talking with them on the phone, just trying to get better and better in my English. I still write like a two years old <laughs> in English, but I speak fluently. Your English is when outstanding. I got army, when I got to the army, I ditched the thing because I'm a family-oriented person and I like to be on the ground and I love my family and I don't want to leave them for so long. And when I'm going to have my own kids, of course. Uh, so I'm going to be a pilot one day, but for me, for fun. Uh, but I ditched the commercial part. But I still have a good English. You know, you're a magnificent person. You really are. And I, uh, I, I enjoyed and I'm honored to have spent this time with you. And I tell you something even greater than that. When we here in Canada and we here in the United States and in the West, when we're scared and when we wonder about the future of our people and the future of Eretz Yisrael, when we're able to put a face to our uh, response to our fear, and that face is yours, Itai, or the face is those of your, your three friends who have passed away, God, God bless their souls. I'm telling you something, I can sleep better. And, and I know that I can, my son sleeps better. So I want to thank you from the depths of my heart. And on behalf of the Jewish people everywhere, I want to thank you so much for your character, um, for your strength, for your bravery. And I want to thank your father, the chicken farmer. And I want to thank your mother, the tourist guy, because they did a wonderful job on you, my friend. A wonderful thank job. Thank you so much. I want to finish with one last thing. Yeah. And the Jewish people... In the hardest time, we say Shema Yisrael. And when we say Shema Yisrael, Adonai Lecho, Adonai Chad, we call for each other. We call for unity. We call for Israel and for the help of the people next to us and the Jews all around the world. And only then when we're together and only then when we're united in the same cause, only then God can come and help us. And every day we need to know that, that as long as we are united, we will achieve everything. And if not, we will lose. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, check out Beit HaLochem. It's a great place to put your uh, tzedakah, your charitable uh, funds. And it's also a wonderful place to, to volunteer. Um, I recommend it highly and they've done unbelievable things from 60,000 uh, warriors, 60,000 veterans in Israel. And part of that is bringing Itai Sagi here so they understand his stories and remember those who fell together with him. Until we meet again, thank you so much for watching. Thank, thank you, you so much. much for listening, right? Take care, right, uh, Itai? All right. And uh, until we meet again, like they say in Yiddish, Zygazint. You know what that means, Zygazint, Itai? No. You don't speak any Yiddish, do you? It means go in health. It means go yeah. in health. Okay. We love you deeply. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.